What's <coughs> up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. We're seeing uh, we're seeing more properties like this being built in front of a house. It's going to be torn down soon. I understand that there are power lines that are just kind of close. What's up again? This is Dan Fradenberg, and that there is a commercial real estate building. I'm joined today with Lauren Sinadella. Is that how you pronounce it, or did I put you in? No, you got it perfect. Good job. Good stuff. And how are you doing today, Arn? Uh, doing good. Uh, happy to be here and look forward to the chat. Awesome. Awesome. And I got some great news for you, Arn. Today, my very favorite audience member is joining me today. And why is my favorite audience member here today? It's because this is a chance encounter where I interview commercial real estate syndicators, investors, operators, all that kind of fun stuff. And then the question might come up, why would you do such a silly thing? Well, if you've ever heard of private off-market or 506B deals, then you know that you, the SEC requires that you have a documented prior substantive relationship or else they'll get ants in their pants. So that's what I'm up to right here. And you get the benefit of learning how to effectively communicate on the subject of commercial real estate deals. But before we get too excited about that, Arn, do you want to say a thing or two about yourself? Uh, sure. So um, I've been in the real estate business since 1978. So I think that's about 45 years, if I can still do math. Um, had the good fortune to basically grow up in the San Francisco Bay Area and sell real estate in what became Silicon Valley, Menlo Park, Palo Alto, California. Moved to Greenville, South Carolina about eight, nine years ago. And after a long career of single family investing in brokerage, I moved into multifamily about three years ago. And uh, I'm happy to share my experience with your listeners. Excellent. I love it. So uh, the first segment that we go through is always the five distinct motivations. Before I do that, I got to say, but wait, check the check your eight. Arn, I don't know if you can see through your camera and into the audience's device, but down there at the, at the eight, it might be... There might be this hideous subscribe button that it might they might want to do something. Okay, it's a silly joke, and I do it every yeah, time. Yeah, no, you should subscribe, and that way you don't miss any episodes. That's the ticket. All right, awesome. <laughs> so the five distinct motivations. After talking to a whole whack of commercial real estate investors and syndicators and whatnot, I realized that everybody has their own unique motivation, their own reason why, but I found that they fit pretty neatly into these five categories. And of course, commercial deals they take months there's plenty of risks involved so you really need to know well what's going to keep you involved in this deal you know you're actually going to follow through with it and that's why i go through these motivations the first one preservation of purchasing power what's that all about well some people they have a portfolio of assets and the way that they make ends meet is not from a w-2 it's from the profits of ownership now, me personally, that's not what I'm up to, but it's important to recognize that the only reason why somebody in that situation would be going through another acquisition would be either if inflation is eating away from the purchasing power of the cash flow, or if they're going to buy at a steep discount, like when there's distress or an asset crash. Again, that's not me right now. Where I'm at is closer to this one right here, trading time directly for wealth. I have a background in technology, specifically the CRM and online funnel industry. And while I was working for a firm in Ohio that was flipping 10 houses a month, I was watching how my boss was making way more than I was. And yet still I was paying more tax than anybody being a high wage, high salary earner. And it made me think, well, how can I pivot so that I'm getting rewarded in the form of deployed capital? AKA equity. So that's why I'm involved in all that, but that's a little too abstract for a lot of people who first get into this. Most people, when they first get in, they're more attracted to either fast tracking retirement or at least gaining more control over their schedule. Maybe that means working fewer months per year or fewer weeks per month, but regardless, if this is your main motivation, then it's really a scaling back of sorts, which is in vast 
contrast to the next group, their ambition is in the front seat and they want to buy their entire hometown. They want to make sure that their great grandchildren never have to hold a day job. And so they're going to hustle into their nineties with, with all of these acquisitions and they're great people to have on your team. And the last group though, they're also going to have a similar level of hustle, but their motivation is slightly different. Maybe they found a sector of society, or maybe it's animals, or maybe it's the environment. Maybe they want to send people to space. Who knows? But if you want to make a really big difference, there is a financial component to it. And that's why some people are making these acquisitions. So Arne, of those five different motivations, what combination of those would you say describes you best? Well, it, it's a great list. And certainly as an apartment investor, one of the things I take great satisfaction in is providing hardworking people a nice place to live, safe, modern, everything works. You have some pride in the properties you own. Uh, love my hometown of Greenville, South Carolina, so would love to buy as much of it as I can. And then um, throughout my life, real estate investing has provided this time freedom that you've talked about. And you can think about it as that capital you have invested in real estate, every day that those dollars get up and go to work for you, right? They get dressed, they go to the office, they go to the factory and they work for you while perhaps you're serving your community or going to church or playing with your kids. So the time freedom aspect of it is very important to me. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. That brings me to the next question, which is a tolerance for risk assessment. Now, if you've ever been involved in a 506B deal, the securities attorneys really should have forced you to fill out this really invasive financial questionnaire to get an idea of where you're at in your investments, your experience, your level of sophistication, appetite for risk, and that sort of thing. But I got to say, there was one question when I went through it that I wasn't really satisfied with the options because I didn't feel like it was really revealing that the, the person understood the fact that these are illiquid assets, there are risks involved, and you have to understand if you're going to get involved in that. So I devised this fill in the blanks question, which I think uh, achieves that a little bit better. The question is, there are many popular investment asset classes, but I think blank is too risky. Arn, it can be inside real estate, it could be outside of real estate. What's too risky for you? Uh, Bitcoin, because I don't understand it. So I'm not going to invest in something I don't understand. Real estate, simple, right? People need to live somewhere. We've all rented apartments and homes. So only invest in things you understand. And I can't for the life of me figure out what Bitcoin is. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, you know, and of course, real estate, it's the roof over your head. That makes lots of sense. You know, food, you know, you understand that you can just gobble it up. It's just like this subscribe <laughs> sandwich. This thing just kills me every single time. But it's my segue into the segment with the Dan Does Deals Commercial Core Competency Cube. It's got the six different core roles in a commercial deal. And it's absolutely free to download and like a complete dummy. I don't even ask for your contact information in return for this freebie. You should always ask for contact information in return for your freebie. But I want to make sure that you can print this out and practice these six different terms so that you can effectively commu communicate on the subject of commercial real estate. And in every episode of Chance Encounters, I take two minutes to go through the six different sides and uh, it's, it's really great stuff. So let's get started. First one, the repositioner. They are an acquisitions person. So they look at a bunch of different properties. They do a bunch of different paperwork. What's this paperwork you may ask? Probably not. But anyway, the paperwork is they're gonna underwrite the deal. That means they're doing the math. They're figuring out, first of all, is the broker or seller actually even telling the truth about how much the money, how much money, how much revenue that property is actually making at that point? Because you have to find that out for yourself. Now, the repositioner's other job is to figure out how can they find more upside? How can they make this property perform better than it is already? And the more confusing side of what a repositioner has to do, they have to have a lot of investor or financier relations with banks and different lenders. And the idea is a financier is somebody who only deals with paper and money, so they're not actually involved in the deal except for just signing on the dotted line and putting in some of their hard-earned cash. But uh, the reason why that's such a key part 
part in commercial real estate is because if you can get a more advantageous loan, that goes straight to the profitability of the building. So they're always looking for more financiers, these repositioners here. But the more traditional place to look to find that upside, the repositioners are going to look at the operations and say, hey, are those Benjamins just going down the toilet? Well, we need to stop that. But of course, there's a lot more to operations than just collecting rent and mowing lawns and all that kind of fun stuff. Me personally, because of my marketing and content creation and online funnel, that whole aspect, there's a bit of automation that I can bring to the table. But more often, it's the marketing chops that end up coming in. Because even if you're outsourcing to a third party for your operations, you might have a vacancy rate problem that only marketing can fix. So that's where I come into my GP teams. But honestly, for a repositioner, the operations, there's only so much wiggle room and innovation that you can find on that. So more often than not, the repositioners will get a contractor team involved to upgrade the units, to do a value add or do some renovations. Now, of course, the reason behind that is that the next resident, because it's an upgraded unit, they'll be happy to pay more in rent than the previous one. It's a nicer place. But of course, you can sink endless amounts of money into your construction, your contractors, and your upgrades. Like you could even gold plate the toilets. You just won't get any return on investment. So you better be careful. Somebody has to keep an eye on these guys. And if you have the same problem that I have, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm from the internet. So that means I need locals. I need boots on the ground, somebody who's nearby who can get to the property in an hour or two because I categorically will not be able to make it there in an hour or two. I'd still be stuck at an airport. But once this team is all assembled and the repositioner has found a prospective property, they turn around to the financiers and they say, hey, I got this great property. It's 350 units. It's tens of millions of dollars. You don't happen to have, say, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars you want to lend us, do you? Well, there's one other issue here, even in a hypothetical here, which is they're going to ask, who's your sponsor? Who's your KP? What's that all about? You might be, even if you've gone through a coaching program with a guru or something like that, I find they tend to gloss over this one. And what it's all about is if you are, say, an engineer or a physician, something like that, and you and a group of friends want to take over a commercial property, the snag you're going to run into is you're not going to be eligible for a commercial loan unless somebody in the fold already owns a similar asset. So you're not getting any 350 unit apartment complexes unless you're partnering with somebody who already has a 350 unit apartment complex. On top of that, you need a certain amount of liquidity. And then among the owners, you need a balance sheet of at least the amount of the loan. But if you have all those pieces, you got yourself a commercial real estate deal. So Arne, as far as uh, your competencies, your next deal, like I understand that you might be buying for your own uh, portfolio rather than trying to partner on and others, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm not uh, familiar enough with your business, but where do you fit in on these, uh, on these different roles? Well, I would say I'm the repositioner. <clears throat> so normally I'm the one hunting down the deals, kind of doing the analysis. And then I act as my own KP, and I also raise capital from my investors. My primary partner is on the most important end of that cube, and that's the operations. That's not where I'm strong. So I have a really trusted partner, good friend, Brian, who handles the day-to-day -day operations of the asset. And really, at the end of the day, that's the key component to a successful real estate investment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I totally agree. It, it really is somewhat of a bottleneck that I think in a lot of programs and coaching programs, they don't really talk about. And if you just think about, well, back in high school, when everybody was saying, oh, so what are you going to be when you grow up, you know, before they went off to college, how many of them said, I really want to manage a multifamily property. So, you know, like the desire, the demand isn't, uh, isn't high enough for, uh, for to ha you to have an endless number of applicants who uh, will be willing to, uh, to take care of the place. But that's fantastic. The next question I have to do, uh, I have to ask you, it has to do with the buy box. And when investors and syndicators are asking, hey, what's your ideal property? What are you looking for? What's your buy box? We're mainly looking for three things. First one's geography. Where is it? So that's which state, 
which county, possibly even which neighborhood, okay? It's all going to matter. The second one's gonna be size. Now, my guests generally are in multifamily, so that means the way to judge the size is by unit count. And it's very important because it's a completely different group that takes over five unit com apartment complexes compared to 350 unit apartment complexes. So we need to know what's ideal as far as the size goes. Now, the third one is class. And unfortunately, I don't like it when people use one word to mean two different things. So I split class into condition and area. So when I'm talking about condition, I'm talking about how old is this building? How beat up is this building? How up to date is it? What about amenities? Is it a really nice place to be? Or is it supposed to be real bare bones and uh, just more affordable than anything else? So that's the condition. The area, however, that's talking about what's the crime rate like where this property is located. What, uh, what about the, uh, uh, the school districts where this property is located? And then, of course, when they say location, 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 they're really talking about how many humans go by that place on a given day. So car traffic, foot traffic, all that kind of stuff. And they're both basically the desirability of the building and the way that they rate both the area and the condition is just the same as in grade school where you got a plus at the top and then a and then a minus and then b plus and so on so uh Arne, you're all in on uh, greenville south carolina as far as i know but uh don't let me put words in your mouth uh what you're looking for sure so we are very geographic focused unlike many operators and so we focus on greenville south carolina the, the larger region is called the upstate. It's about nine counties in the northwest part of the state. My partner, Brian, lives in Greenville here. His company, Progressive Properties of Greenville, is here, 10 employees. Um, so we're very Greenville focused. It's a great market. In terms of size of asset, we actually focus on the sub 100 unit properties because we're not set up for on-site property management. We use more residential models. So Brian and I are vertically integrated in that the property manager is also part of the GP, but we actually like the sub 100 units. And then in terms of class, um, we definitely stay out of war zones, but other than that, we're pretty open. And so we own things from 1984 build to we're now buying new new build duplexes in Greenville because we think they make a lot of sense. So we're open to the age of the asset, no war zones. And I would say most of our assets are in neighborhoods where the median household income is maybe 65, 70 to about 90. So pretty solid middle income neighborhoods. We don't do the fancy new construction downtown. This is more affordable housing, but it's good quality and nice, safe locations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So my next question has to do with who's out there in the audience, who you're best suited to help. And I got to say, my favorite thing about commercial real estate is that because it's multifaceted, people are so friendly and eager to give referrals, help build new teams and whatnot. But at the same time, because we have our own unique skill sets, we're better suited to help some people more than others. Me personally, the sponsor KPs, I'm always eager to talk to just because I'm from the internet. And and also because I'm from the internet, it's the locals, the boots on the ground. Those are the, the irreplaceable two pieces of the die that, uh, that I need a, a constant inflow of. Uh, but uh, Arn, how about you? Uh, and I think you know about the securities laws. So if you have any 506B deals, you shouldn't say that you're looking, you shouldn't mention the deal itself. So uh, who are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for, so first, by the way, most of the deals we do are 506B. Uh, we tend to do smaller syndications where the properties are three, four, five million, the raises are a million five to two million. So we do 506B and we'll take a minimum $25,000 investment. So for us, it's important to offer these opportunities to regular people, let's call it, uh, to get the advantage of real estate investing. And I would say most of them are probably in that 40-year-old age bracket, making good money, 
but they're busy with their kids, their job, and they know real estate is good, but either they don't have the time or the knowledge to buy it themselves. So the, the syndication and the group approach really works well for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. And then as far as how to reach out, uh, I'm lucky enough to have a pretty distinct last name. So I'm easy to find, especially on LinkedIn, where I spend most of my time. But uh, if you scan this QR code with your phone, that brings you to the FAQs page of 506 BME, which is the platform that I started to help investors and syndicators document their substantive relations so that they can actually make sure that uh, when the ACC audits them, if you hit that level of assets as under management or whatnot, that uh, you've got something to show them, which is uh, a more of a challenge than it sounds. But uh, Arne, if, uh, if people want to reach out to you, I know you're active on LinkedIn as well, uh, but uh, what are the best ways to reach out? Sure. So my website is investwithspark.com. And on LinkedIn, you can find me as an individual, Arne Sinadella, or under Spark Investment Group. All right, beautiful. And then the last thing that I have, it's actually not for you, Arne, it's for you in the audience. It's a public service announcement. If you've been watching this episode and you've been experiencing searing pains in your eyeballs and like migraine-like symptoms, I'm confident it's the hideous subscribe button to blame and to get rid of it you just click on it, it doesn't cost you anything and uh the reason why i'm biased and i want people to click on it is because then if enough people do youtube will start paying for these videos instead of me i think that would be absolutely amazing but uh, as far as you're concerned all it would mean is that my videos may show up on your list of suggestions but you can go ahead and ignore them I quite frankly just appreciate the fact that you joined me today. Just like Arn, I appreciate you joining me today. This has been great getting to know you a little bit better. Yes, thank you so much. It was fun. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Make sure you 506 B me. Any syndicators, make sure you 506 B me. Hi. Oh, hey. Yeah, here's my code. You got your QR code scanner. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just hold it right in the square there. Okay, cool. And now you hit open in browser. Okay. Okay. Are you already logged into 506 BB? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so there's my video. So now I'm already on your watch list. So when you get back to your hotel, you can find out what my core competencies are and my level of sophistication. Sound good? Yeah. I love your hat. Real estate's a scam. That's really funny. Yeah, that's funny. Nice meeting you. You too. 506 BB, everybody.